the ability to know facts of the form x is phi is acquired. Um, what Sellers will argue is that Sellers will basically kind of endorse A and C um, and refuse B. Um, I mean, the trial is that, okay, A and B together entail not C, B and C entail not A, A and C entail not B. They can't be reconciled. But what's, what's interesting about Sellers is that he won't deny that you can have a non-inferential relationship to experiences. He will just claim that your ability to have this non-inferential relation, this non-inferential knowledge is itself uh, acquired. It has to be acquired through a process of training and indoctrination. Um, so... Um, so the question then is, um, how do we acquire this capacity? Okay. So, but, so basically, Sarah sets himself the following challenge. He says, given that we have to acquire the ability um, to. Um, either to, you know, to justify, to be able to learn how to justify a belief, to make an inference about what kind of belief justifies what other beliefs, but also even to be able to understand when we don't need to justify um, a belief in terms of another belief, um, we need to introduce a series of distinctions. The, the, the distinction is fundamental, fundamentally between um, sapience and sentience. Okay? Sapience is normative. It involves conceptual knowledge. It involves conceptualization. Um, sapience is intellection in Bergson's sense. Um, sentience is merely kind of, is, is, is a ubiquitous feature of all um, organic life. Okay? It's simply the capacity to register a, a somatic stimulus. Okay? Plants can do it, organisms can do it, human beings can do it. So the question is, how do we explain the articulation between sapiens and sentience to explain how human beings um, acquire the capacity to have experiences and to have experiences that are both conceptual in character but also non-conceptual. Um, Now, what, in order to, to do this, he, what Sellers is, must challenge, first of all, is two things. He's going to challenge the claim that, um, he, he's going to challenge classic accounts of the nature of thinking and of the nature of sensing. He's going to, he's going to challenge the, the claim um, that, um, for instance, that intentionality or directedness is the mark of the mental. And that you can understand the relationship between mind and world in terms of like, intentionality. And that um, it's our ability to kind of, that we have um, an intentional relationship to phenomena before we um, have that, that a kind of a intentional objectivation, or phenomenal objectivation is the condition of possibility for interacting with physical objects and physical phenomena. Um, there's a classic account that says that um, whatever um, our ability to have thoughts about something, and also intentionality also means being able to kind of have beliefs with determinate content that, that are about things or states of affairs in the world. Um, the classic account tries to say that linguistic intentionality is derived from psychological intentionality. So in other words, intentionality is, is an originary phenomenological or psychological phenomenon, and that words and utterances derive their intentionality, which is to say their aboutness from the mind. And Sellers inverts this. He says, no, it's actually the other way around. The capacity, aboutness is primarily a semantic phenomenon. Um, and it's the, you, in order to understand aboutness, it involves understanding the relationships between words and, and other sets of words, between utterances or inscriptions and other sets of utterances and inscriptions. So, uh, for instance, when we say, um, uh, the example that Sellers gives is rot means red, um, the, the mention of the German expression rot 
is correlated with the use of a red expression, red. Um, but all we're doing there is correlating the conceptual role played by this linguistic token in the German language with the conceptual role played by red in our language. There is no point at which concepts come into contact with some allegedly extra conceptual reality. You cannot correlate words and things, concepts and objects. Because to do that, you have to assume some miraculous pre-established harmony between the mental and the physical, between mind and world. And Sellers, as a good Darwinian naturalist, says that that's not possible. Even intentionality, if you have to transcendentalize intentionality, that's simply kind of, that becomes a sky group, an unexplained explainer. And he says that given that we are um, descended from mindless animals, we have to explain the emergence of the capacities for intentional correlation without simply postulating it as this transcendental um, sine qua non. Um, so in other words, so he reverses the order of explanation and says that it's our capacity to engage two things, our capacity to learn how to apply concepts appropriately and then to develop resources so that we can use language to talk about language. In other words, um, a language that develops um, a, a semantic dimension requires the ability, semantic asset, the ability to talk about talk or to, um, to engage in this meta level of description where you can describe correlations between systems of words, um, the functional role of, of one set of utterances and those of another set of utterances. Um, so the intentionality in that sense becomes neutralized, becomes a linguistic phenomenon and that the aboutness then of um, our, our capacity to deploy concepts and to think about red appropriately, to say that's red in the appropriate circumstances, is depends on two things. One, it depends on our being, having what, what Sellers calls, um, or actually what Brandon calls, a reliable responsive differential disposition. It means what you, what you simply need is you need to be able to register differences, to track and record salient differences. This is something that thermostats and parrots can do. Um, a thermostat, the states of a thermostat track the temperature in a room because there's a mechanism that simply kind of correlates the kind of uh, the degree, you know, the uh, molecular excitation in the, um, in the room and the uh, a mercury gauge or whatever. Um, similarly, a parrot will eventually learn to say red um, simply by being conditioned, by being trained to respond in this way systematically. It says this is how it is originally with human beings. Human beings are conditioned, first of all, they have to be conditioned to respond appropriately and to issue the, appro the appropriate linguistic tokens in the relevant circumstances. But then the next step is being able to deploy a concept, okay, and the difference here is this is the difference between, once again, between um, sentience and sapience. Once is a purely causal, mechanical order of explanation, and the, and, and the other is normative and conceptual. Uh, you cannot, although the ability, or abilities to kind of to deploy concepts require certain neurophysiological um, uh, mechanisms and uh, uh, you know, conditions of acculturation, they can't be straightforwardly, they can never be identified or reduced to them. Um, so, the first thing that Sellers will say is that the, the contents of um, a thought, our ability to understand ourselves as thinking be, being, moves from our ability to understand, to recognize one another's um, systems of utterances in appropriate circumstances. So in other words, you learn how to understand if someone is in front of a red triangle, they'll say that's a red triangle. And you attribute, and what sounds this infamous myth of Jones, the myth by which he challenges the myth of the given is simply this. The myth of Jones is the personification of a process, of a structural process, through which um, we internalize a new system of concepts in order to identify hitherto unrecognized 
phenomena, which is to say psychological phenomena. Um, what happens is Jones is this mythical genius who says that um, what's happening, who, who proposes to explain the behavior of human beings, not just in terms of their dispositions to kind of make sounds in certain circumstances. In other words, the classic behaviorist account kind of would say, all there is to you um, having, you know, when you see red things, you're just conditioned to kind of say red. Okay, so that, that would be a, a classic kind of behaviorist account. Jones wants to say that um, the next step, rather, Selger Jones wants to say that um, a crucial kind of um, that, no, crucial progress is made when you realize that you can explain um, human beings' kind of um, human behavior and the, uh, the complicated kind of um, patterns that human beings engage in by postulating unobservable internal states. And you use them to explain the physical behavior. Okay, so in other words, you say, he says that's red because he believes that that's red. Two things. One is that this, this is um, 